morning, everyone, to this last day of the school, um, uh, which uh, Sylvain will begin with his second lecture. Please, Sylvain, you can begin. Right. Yeah, thanks. Okay, so welcome back, everyone. And so let me then start this lecture by briefly just uh, restating where we are and what we now want to do. So in the first lecture, we have a brief overview of Fortich and Simon and its relation with integrability. And then we re-explain what was the standard 3D Chen Simon theory. And now what, we, what I would like to do now in this lecture is to start now introducing the 4D one, the 4D Chen Simon theory, and in particular, explain what is this gauge field and how it depends on a certain choice of meromorphic one form omega. And then I will explain in more detail the relation to integrable field theory that we sketched a bit before, which is obtained by going to a specific gauge where there's no Z-bar component in the gauge field, basically, which will allow us to identify a lax dimension. In particular, we'll see that this satisfies the lax equation and will be meromorphic in the spectral parameter. And in particular, one of the things that I would like to explain in this is uh, what is the dependence in Z, and in particular show that uh, this will have poles at what I call zeta here, which are the zeros of this uh, one form omega and which yesterday I called disordered effects. And so this here will be basically this lecture for, uh, for this morning. And then the next part, which will be this afternoon, will be to try to identify exactly what is the integrable field theory behind, and that will be related to poles of this omega, and that will be then later. OK, but then let me now start with really the 4D Chen Simons theory. And let me start by introducing its main, well, ingredient, for instance, its gauge field and its action. So to start, we we'll actually start by defining what is the space time of, the, of this theory. And well, as we mentioned already yesterday, what we'll do is we'll take the space-time in the following form. So part of it will be sigma, which is a two-dimensional space with coordinate t and x, where in the end, t will be the time coordinate of my 2D integrable field theory, and x will be the space coordinate of this integrable field theory. And then to get this to now a four-dimensional space, what we add is CP1, which is just a complex plane plus infinity. And on this, we have now a complex coordinate Z, and then it's conjugate Z bar. Okay. And now in terms of this, for the moment, I consider a gauge field, which is a Lie algebra valued one form on M, meaning that it takes the form of well, that we've seen before. So A now has a component along dt, a component along dx, a component along dz, and a component along dz bar. And actually, for the moment, because I have some complex coordinate z and z bar, I will have at some I will have to complexify everything. So in particular, instead of working with the real algebra that we had before, like SUN and so on, we will have to actually work with uh, complexified algebra, which I denote by this GC here. So for instance, if we have SUN, the corresponding complexified the algebra is SLNC. And well, concretely, it means that we consider all these uh, fields for the moment are com uh, as complex fields. And then later, we'll actually put reality conditions on all this so that all the theory is real. But instead of here discussing the reality conditions every time I introduce a new object, what I'll do is for the moment, I'll consider everything complex. And then later, I will discuss all the reality conditions in, in just one go to avoid having to do it each time. OK, so now in terms of this gauge field, we can consider the Chan Simons free form exactly as we constructed it in the uh, 3D Chan Simons theory, which was constructed then as taking, well, A wedge 
FDA plus two thirds of a wedge A wedge A. And then all this, because it's a matrix valued free form, now we take a trace. And now all this gives us then a number. Well, uh, sorry, a free form, but valued in a complex number. And well, now this is a free form. So in the case of Friedrich and Simons, we define the action by simply integrating this free form over M. But now the problem is that, well, this is a free form in a four dimensional manifold. So I cannot integrate it just like that on the four manifold because it's only a free form. So I need to add something. And well, what I'll do is that I'll take the integral of CSA. And then in front of this, I will add a one form omega wedge CSA, where now omega phi z dz is then a meromorphic one form on CP1. Okay, so, and now that I wedged with omega, I have a free form with a one form, so I have a four form, and so that now I have I can integrate it over my, my manifold. Okay, so now let's see the consequence of this thing. So, okay, let me also recall that this is part of the defining data then of this theory, right? This, this one form omega, I will just fix it to be a specific one form, which depends in a certain way in, the, in Z. And now I will work with a fixed one, and it's the different omega defines different for the and Simon sphere. Okay. So now what we see is that in particular, if we if we go to components, uh, and okay, sorry, I should say also that in general I put a prefactor in front of it, which here for future convenience is just i of a four pi, but it's just a matter of convention. Now if I go to to components and I write uh, this action really in terms of my coordinates. Well, I can see this as integrating over sigma, so in, over my coordinate dtm dx, then integrating over cp1, so integrating over dz and dz bar. And then I will have my phi z here, and then my three dimensional, my free form here. So, which gives me epsilon mu nu rho trace of a mu d nu a rho plus two third a mu a nu a rho. But now the important point is because omega here was in the direction of dz, when I take a wedge with something, it means that in the end, this will eliminate all the dz components in this in this free form, right? Because I know that if I have dz wedge dz, it gives me zero because of the skew symmetry. So I cannot have anything along dz in this direction, meaning that when I have this integrate the integration here of these components, I actually need to restrict to the indices mu, nu, and rho, which are only the indices which are not z. So I have only the indices x, uh, t, x, and z bar. And well, what we see from there is that this is basically it tells us schematically that, well, the Lagrangian of 4D and Simons is more or less, well, the, my phi z dz, so my omega times the Lagrangian of 3D and Simons, but only along the direction tx and z bar. And so I completely forgot in some sense about the direction Z or the chern Simon scope. And these are these have consequences. So in particular, we see that there's no dz in the action. There's never any derivative with respect to z. And there's also no az in the action. The z component of the gauge field completely decoupled. Which means that actually AZ is not a real dynamical field of the theory. I can shift it by whatever I want. It, won't, it actually won't change my action. So I can always actually fix 
a z to be zero, for instance. And I could take any other thing that actually would not matter at all in the, in the theory, I would be fine, but just for simplicity, I put it to zero, meaning that now I will focus on a being just along the component then dt, dx, and dz bar. Okay. So now that we have written this Jan Simons action in four dimension, what we can look at is the equation of motion. And we can also look at the gauge symmetries. And we'll start with the equation for motion. And for that, well, we do as usual, we consider a variation, an infinitesimal variation, delta A of our gauge field. And in the end, we want to find what is the variation of the uh, what is the variation of the action? And for that, well, what we'll need to first do is compute the variation of what is inside of this action. In particular, remember that in the previous um, lecture, in when we studied 3D Jan Simons theory, we actually studied the variation of CSA of the free form A. And that was a result that actually was not specified to just 3D, that was just a simple computation of variation. And this is still true now in 4D. So in particular, we can use this result now. And we had then that if I consider the variation of CSA, we had two type of term. We had a term which was two times trace of the curvature of A wedge delta A minus a total derivative term which was d trace of a wedge delta a. And now what I will do is, well, because I am now the 4 h and Simons, I will consider the variation of this thing wedged with my omega. But omega here is a constant, right? It's just a specified one form. So of course the delta doesn't hit it, right? So I can just put my omega in front of all this. And now, well, what I would like to do is this term actually will be basic. I can basically put it back inside of the integral and, and look at it. And this term, well, before we had a total derivative, but now that, that we, I wedged it with omega, it's not a total derivative anymore. So I'll do the standard trick of recreating a total derivative by using the Leibniz rule. Okay, and well, if I do that, in the end, what I get is the following. So in the first term I have, two trace of omega wedge f a wedge delta a. To recreate the total derivative, I need to use Leibniz and that will create now the d acting on omega. And I get then times this trace. And then I have the total derivative of omega wedge the trace. Okay. okay. And so now I can put this back inside of my integral. This thing here gives a boundary term. And well, now if I look at my boundaries, so my M is sigma cross CP1. CP1 is just a closed Riemann sphere with the, with the point of infinity. So this actually has no boundary. So I cannot have boundary terms coming from there. So all the boundary can come from the sigma part, the T and X part. And that will typically, for instance, if we take sigma to be R2, it means that the boundary will be at space time infinity. And in this case, we would typically ask our gauge field to vanish sufficiently fast at infinity. First. Or if we have a cylinder, we can ask for boundary conditions and, and things like that. But what we mean is that here we can impose natural boundary condition of our gauge field along sigma so that this boundary term in the end is zero. So when we re reintroduce all this inside of the action, we find that then the variation of the action, there's two terms. This first one here gives i over two pi integral over m of trace omega wedge fa wedge delta a. 
And then we have i over four pi integral of g omega wedge the trace of a wedge delta. Okay. So this for us will be our starting point now to study the, the equation of motion of the theory. And for that, we'll study a little bit these two different terms in it. Give me a little bit of space. In particular, let's look at this term here. And let's think of what is d omega. So remember that omega is phi z z, right? It's just a meromorphic one form. In particular, it does not depend at all on the t and the x directions. So when I take the differential here, the exterior derivative uh, by d omega, well, I cannot have any dx or dt. And also I cannot have any dz because this is already along dz. So then I will take a wedge of dz, wedge dz, and that would be zero. So actually the only possibility that I can have here is I have dz bar phi z times, well, dz bar wedge dz. Right? And that, if I look at what this is, so phi z is a meromorphic function of z. And so if I apply dz bar on it, I find actually zero. And well, more precisely, I find zero only on CP1, to which I have removed the point that I will call z, which are the poles of omega, or if you want the poles of phi z. Because of course, my phi z is holomorphic only in the, in the region of CP1 where it's not infinite, right? where, it has a, where it does not have poles. So this thing equal to zero is actually true only on CP1 where I removed the pole. And more actually more precisely, and that will we'll come back to this later uh, in more details, but let, for the moment, let me just tell it in there. I hope you believe me. What you find is if you consider the thing not on CP1 removed by Z, but on the whole CP1, you find a distribution uh, on CP1 with support Z. And what I mean by that is typically it would be things like a delta distribution of z minus y, where this y here belongs to this, these poles. And this, what you can expect is something that is indeed is zero everywhere outside of, of the poles, right? So it's zero on CP1 of a, z, of a z, as we expect. But then, well, when we have some poles, we have some kind of singularity happening, and they take the form of distribution, so typically Dirac distribution. And actually, in general, we could also have derivative of Dirac distribution. And that we will come back on this later, but the consequence for the moment, it's just that this thing here, this term, when I integrate it then over M, the D omega being a distribution over Z, this creates just a defect term. So a 2D defect term on sigma cross Z where now I still integrate over the dt and dx part, but on the CP1 part, I have now just localized to a finite number of points, which were the poles of my omega. And so this then will need, will need this is where we'll need to have boundary condition there, and this will treat it, let, treat it later. And in details, because actually it will be quite important for what we'll do, but for the moment, I will kind of put it aside and now we'll focus now on this term. Because this term, it's not a 2D term, right? There's no distribution there. This is really a local term in 4D. So this is what we call, would call standardly a bulk term, right? So it's a, it's a 4D bulk. OK, I see a question by Costas. Uh, Sylvain, yes. uh, may I ask something? When you say poles, you mean uh, si simple poles or even higher ones? I it have in be. mind that I have yeah. in mind that the uh, dz bar on one over z is pi times delta function. Yeah. 
But if it's one over z square, then uh, I think it's zero. Yes. No, uh, so actually, so indeed it could be here, I owe the pole. And actually what will happen, so indeed this delta that happens only when I have a simple pole at y. And if I have a high order pole, what will happen is that will create derivative of the delta distribution. Because typically if I have one over z, then to get one over z squared, I can act by the derivative respect to z. And then that will mean that I will create uh, the derivative of the delta distribution with respect to Okay, z. okay, thanks. Okay, and thanks for the question because also that reminds me of something I wanted to to mention that in general for when omega has uh, a simple pole, we can really define it, define all the action in this way. When omega is higher order the pole, there's actually some kind of regularization to do. Here, I won't really enter into this detail for us. It's not so important to, to understand what's happening, but if you if we want to define everything very quite rigorously, you actually need to, to regularize what happened for higher order pole. And this, well, okay, you can see in the lectures, I mentioned some references uh, about this. And this will have some importance for us for high order pool because we'll create derivative terms typically in the defects. Okay, are there other questions so far? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case. So let me then go on. So now, to get the equation of motion, well, we want this, vari this variation of the action to be zero. And what we see is we have a 4D bulk term and a 2D defect term. And well, for these two to be, for, for the whole thing to be zero, actually the bulk term and the defect term, I can make them vary independently one from each other because I can change what happened in the bulk without changing what happened on the defect or, or conversely, right? So for actually this to be zero for all variation delta A, I actually need them to be zero independent. And so in particular for the moment, if I want just to really find the bulk equation of motion, I can focus on this term and say that this term should be zero for all delta A, which basically means that my omega wedge FA here should be zero. And so from there, I get simply the equation of motion of the theory, which is that omega wedge FA is equal to zero. And if I analyze a little bit this thing, well, I see that I get again, as standard in, in Chan Simons, I get a zero curvature equation. But now because I have my omega in front of it, and remember that omega is along dz, the effect is that when I write it in a component as well, d mu a nu minus d mu a mu plus a mu a nu equals zero. Well, this I have it only for mu and nu which are in Tx and Z bar, right? Because my omega here is along dz, so it kills all the dz. And so I get a zero curvature equation, but only along the direction Tx and Z bar. I kind of, once again, I kind of decoupled the Z direction. Okay, so that is my equation of motion that will be useful for us later. And now the last thing I wanted to mention is about gauge transformation. And more precisely, I will call them for the moment, and I will call them formal gauge transformation. And I will, I will come back on the name formal a bit later. And so these gauge transformation, they are made by some function u, which are function from my 4D space time m, to the group. So more precisely here, the complexified group because I complexified everything, right? So Woosley algebra is GC. And it acts on my gauge field as the standard gauge transformation in non-Abelian gauge theory, which is then U A U inverse minus D U U inverse. And in particular, I remember Recall that, that we, we've said before that the curvature of A, it is a covariant quantity, so it transforms just by conjugation under this, under this kind of transformation, meaning in particular that, well, the uh, equation of motion omega wedge FA equals zero is gauge invariant. 
if I have one solution, then the, uh, of course, I have another solution by applying any gauge transformation. But now we can ask the question, is the action gauge invariant? And that is actually a quite more complicated question. And in particular, what we get in the end is that for really the action to be gauge invariant, we need the real gauge, what I will call the real gauge transformation, the actual transformation, which are, act which are really gauge symmetries. We need them to preserve the boundary conditions along the, this defect that we had. So this sigma cross Z, right? So remember that at, at the pole Z of omega, we have some, so we have some defects which are important on which we'll have to put boundary conditions. So as I say, I will treat this in details later, but in particular, because we impose boundary condition on A, we'll actually want the gauge transformation, the physical gauge transformation to preserve this boundary condition to be compatible with it. And in the end, the action of the model will be only invariant under these gauge transformation that preserve the boundary condition. And that is actually the reason why I introduced this name formal here. So this formal here is in the position uh, with the real here, right? So real is different than formal. That's what I mean here. So by formal, I would mean any gauge transformation, any transformation of this form we view that does not satisfy any initial condition. And by real gauge transformation, what I would mean is this transformation where now I also ask that you have compatibility with the um, <clears throat> with the, the boundary condition that will introduce it. Okay, so at this point, are there any questions on this part? Okay, if not, then let's continue and let's go on then with now explaining in more details the relation with the lax formalism. of 2D integrable field theories. And let me start by introducing what will be certain fields, which I will call G hat and L. So to, to go further here, we need to suppose that there exists a formal gauge transformation so okay by what i will call then g hat inverse for some reason i put an inverse it will be easier for me later where g hat then is just some function from m to the group gc such that once I did this, once I do this gauge transformation by this function g hat, well, more precisely g hat inverse, when I go to the z bar component, I actually find zero. Okay, so that's that's our assumption, and that is basically what uh, yesterday we we mentioned as being the the axial gauge, right? It's we suppose that we go to a gauge where we killed one of the components of the of the theory of the gauge field, and here we suppose that we we kill the component z bar. And we, we call by j hat inverse, the transformation that we use to go to this gauge. And well, this is actually equivalent to saying that in my initial gauge, my a z bar should be equal to minus d z bar, G hat 
g hat inverse, right? So that you can convince yourself if you have a z bar of this form and you do the gauge transformation by g hat inverse with this gauge transformation here, what will happen is that you will exactly kill this, uh, this term here and you will get to the point to a z bar equals zero in this new gauge by g inverse, right? And now what we'll do is we'll also define L as well the thing that we get in this uh, the the new gauge that we get in this uh, where, where there's no z bar components, which now then take the form lt dt plus lx dx. Right, it has only component along t and x, and we eliminated now the z bar component and the z component we actually didn't have it from the start. So in conclusion, what we see is that, so a z bar is minus d z bar g hat g hat inverse. And then in the other direction, a t and x, if I actually say what it means so that this l t and l x, they're related to a by a gauge transformation. If I write it explicitly, what it means is that it's j hat l t x, J hat inverse minus D respect to T or X of J hat, J hat inverse. And this, all this, now I can think of this as just you know, So this now I can just think of this as a parameterization. of my gauge field A in terms of, so in, in terms of now two other fields, J hat and L. And I parameterize them in a very specific form, which is exactly made so that if I go to the, comp, to the gauge uh, by G hat inverse, I have no Z bar. Okay. And now from there, what I would like to show is that this is in fact deeply related to integrability, because in particular, we can interpret this L now as a lax connection. And this, well, we've actually kind of said it a little bit in the introduction yesterday, but let me, let me go back in more details on, on, on what happens here. And well, now we can write the equation of motion. So recall that the equation of motion was omega wedge F A equals zero. But we said that we said before that the gauge, the equation of motion is invariant under in in any formal gauge transformation that I can do. So in particular, I can do the gauge transformation by G hat inverse here. Meaning that in the end, I get that omega wedge f of L is equal to zero. And I can write my equation of motion directly in the, in the L, uh, in the gauge L, right? And then when I get two types of terms, I get omega times dt Lx minus dx Lt plus Lt Lx equals zero. So that's when I take the direction t and x, right, along f. And of course, omega is always along dz. And then I can take, if I take omega along dz, then here I take one along dz bar and then either dt or dx. Then what I get is simply that omega times dz bar of L, either L in the t direction or in the x direction is equal to zero. Okay, and this last part here, what it tells me is that LTX is meromorphic. So, okay, let's actually do two steps. It's holomorphic on CP1, or at least it's holomorphic on CP1 
to which I removed d tests, where d tests are the zeros of omega. Because, well, when omega is non zero, I get indeed that dz bar l equals zero. So I can get that this is holomorphic. But when omega is non is actually zero, then it could happen, things could happen here at, uh, at these points over there. And what we'll show actually later, and that is just uh, basically the next section, but for the moment where we made it that, is that actually it's meromorphic. with poles at zeta, right? So it's holomorphic everywhere except there. And then at zeta, we'll actually have poles. And now what we see is that we then get something where we get a, a connection along sigma LTX, right? Which is uh, meromorphic in an in a, well, auxiliary complex parameter Z with certain poles at certain points and which satisfy the zero curvature equation along the directions T and X, so along the direction of sigma. And so these are exactly the conditions to be a lax connection. So LTX, which is now basically, we can see it as a function of the auxiliary parameter Z, is basically now a lax connection. And in particular, what we show is that the spectral parameter of this lax connection is naturally identified with this Z in CP1. And so that's well, what we, we kind of sketched yesterday that uh, putting Z inside of this geometry of the Fury as, as part of the, the space time M in the end will allow us to really identify it with the spectral parameter of the Fury. Okay. Now, uh, what I will do from now is just, I would like to explain in, uh, in a bit more details why this is the case that uh, we will have actually poles at the zeta. So that was a bit faster. And what I would like to, to do is explain in, in, in more details why, why this is the case. But so before that, let me ask, are there questions? Okay. So actually maybe what I can propose is maybe we could do already the break now. That'd be fine for the, okay. the chairs. No, that, that's perfectly fine. Uh, five minutes. Yeah, let's take a five minute break and then I guess. Okay, so then we start five. again at 44. All right, thanks. Okay, Sidra, I think you can start again. Okay, great. So let me then resume the lectures. And so as I said, now I want to explain what are the poles of this fax connection, which if you remember what I mentioned before, they're called disorder defects. So the idea is that if we take, well, first sometimes before even the idea, the, the kind of motivation is that if, if LZ is, holomorphic on CP1, and here I really mean completely holomorphic, that there's no pole or anything. So if there's no pole, I can't do any fraction. So I can't create any, yeah, I can create any fraction. And also if I have no pole at infinity, it means that I cannot have any, for instance, uh, polynomial term. And what I find then is that L of Z in this case would be would actually be a constant function of z. And that would actually not interest us so much, right? Because that would mean that we would have a trivial dependence in a spectral parameter. So that would not be good for integrability. 
So in the end, that tells us that we want LZ not to be, well, holomorphic, but meromorphic. We want LZ to have poles. And that raised the question, well, what poles are possible? And for that, well, recall that the way we got we, the, the information we got about uh, the, the slack connection is what that part of the equation of motion was that omega times dz bar of L was equal to zero. It was part of the equation of motion, the one along z bar. And well, if I have now a zero uh, pole L, so if I have like a one over z minus y, let's say, where y is just a fixed point in, in, a, in CP1, or let's say here in a complex plane, finite complex plane, if I have a term 1 over z minus y in this, uh, in this L, then what I'll do is I'll take the dz bar of this in this equation. And that, well, let me just tell you that this is equal to minus 2 i pi delta 2 z minus y, where this delta here is the, so the Dirac delta distribution with respect to um, with respect to the measure dz wedge dz bar, meaning that if I take any function f and I integrate over CP1, I integrate dz wedge dz bar f z z bar delta 2 z minus y, I get, well, the standard thing of f y y bar, right? I, this is then a two-dimensional delta distribution because it's actually in the complex plane or in the, on the, the Riemann surface, Riemann sphere, and it localized then z and z bar at y and y. And this actually will be an important uh, result for us actually in, in many points in these lectures. So I won't prove it in details today because I don't have the I don't have the time to do it in the lectures, but uh, there is a proof in the appendix of, in one of the appendix of, the, uh, of the, the lecture notes. And just to give a brief intuition of why this could be the case, we actually could have seen similar things in more standard uh, places in, in, in physics, for instance, in electrodynamics, where if you consider the electric field in, a, in, in let's say, three dimension, it behaves typically as a one over R squared, and then when we take the divergence, so we take a derivative, and particularly we have a derivative with respect to R in it, what we know is that this will create then the uh, corresponding punctual charge. So here uh, uh, I'm talking about uh, electric field of a, of a punctual charge, right? Just a Coulomb electric field. Then when we take the derivative with respect to R, what we know is that we should recover the charge. So we should recover basically a delta distribution localized at the center. So we would have something which behave as like a one over R squared and taking a derivative, we would get uh, a delta distribution in three dimensions. This, what we get here is actually, well, something similar to that, but now in two dimension. And actually you can, the, in this appendix, the way this is proven is actually by analogy with the electromagnetism case. So we would consider the, uh, a Coulomb electric field in, a, but just in, in now 2D, and in the end, going back to going from real coordinates to complex coordinates and seeing it in the complex plane, what you'll find is in the end, you can translate this in the fact that taking the derivative respect to z bar of one over z create a delta distribution. Okay. So this will be actually quite useful for us now and actually also later. So let me ask if there are any questions on this at the moment, because I won't really go back on it in, in details. Okay, so if you're happy to admit it, then now we see directly what are the consequences of this, which is that if I want to have a one over z minus y in my, uh, in my lax connection L, then because it creates a delta distribution at the point y, and then I want this multiplied by omega to be zero, I see that the only possibility so that omega times this delta distribution is zero is that actually y is a zero 
of omega, right? So the consequence is that y should be a zero of omega, okay? So now let me just introduce a few notations. So I will define zetas as the set of zeros of omega. And here for, for simplicity, I will suppose that zeta is part of the complex plane only. So I will suppose that I don't have any uh, zero at infinity. This is just, it will make things simpler. If you have zero, if you have zero at infinity, that corresponds to then poles at infinity in the lax. And that would just be polynomial expansion. But here to make things simpler, I will not take any polynomials. So I will have only fractions. And also, I will also suppose that these zeros are simple. And that we could also do the case of higher order zeros. But for simplicity, we'll restrict the case where they are simple. And that roughly will tell us that these poles that we will have in the Lax equation, in Lax connection, will be actually only simple poles. Because, well, as we mentioned a bit before, if we had a high order pole, then instead of a delta distribution, we would create derivative of the delta distribution. And that would mean that the thing that we have in front of it, the omega that we have in front, it should not only be zero, but it should be zero also up to the next order and the next order and so on. So in general, having a zero of order p would mean having a pole of order p in L. But now what we get in the end is through these assumptions, which are here to make things simpler, well, Lz has then poles, simple poles, sorry. At these zeros theta. Okay, so from there we can actually write what LZ then looks like. Means that LZ as a function of Z, well, it's I can sum over all my zeros theta and I get then LY divided that sigmas Y plus also something here that I will then call, let's say L constant, which is then just a constant term, right? Where here the LY and this L constant are, well, one forms now only on the sigma part, right? They depend only on, they're all only along dt and dx and they are functions only on dt and dx. And in particular, so they're independent of z because I completely solved the dependence in z by say, saying that the poles, I localized, I, where are the poles of this, uh, of this L. Okay, and so these are in the, in the language now, for it and Simons, these are called disorder effects, which are then the singularities of this lax connection. And well, in the end, because the singularity of the lax connection and the lax connection is related by gauge transformation to the gauge field itself, they correspond to singularities of the uh, of the gauge field. Yes. Uh, out of curiosity, uh, why disorder or order defects? Uh, yeah, good, um, good question. So, well, I think this this comes back in the end to something which in the end over before about phase transition. Think about that where we had an order operator and disorder operator, which measures the different phases of of, of your theory. Here, it, there are some really that there are phases, but it's basically something related to symmetry. So order is, is something that respects the symmetry, while disorder is something that actually breaks the symmetry. And in Fordit and Simon, the order defects, for instance, are terms that we would add to the action that would preserve the gauge symmetry, their gauge invariant on their own, for instance. While here, the disorder defects, uh, there are something that actually is not gauge invariant in its own. So I think this is a terminology which has to do with, with gauge symmetry, to my understanding. 
Uh, okay, and uh, but in the beginning you said I, I don't really remember. Okay, you also use these order defects or, or, or only for you the disorder effects physically? So okay, yeah. For for these lectures, I'll focus only on disorder defects. I will never talk about order defects. Order defects that they're really treated in a different way in four deep assignments. Actually, what what you would do is you would take this, uh, you would add new terms to the action basically to do this order defects. And okay. here I focus only on disorder ones. Okay, thank you. Okay, so yeah, that was a slight uh, parenthesis on the on the, the origin, but actually for us, I think we don't really need to know that. What we just need to know is these are just singularities in the in L. Okay, so actually, an, in, uh, a point here that uh, will be important for us, and that here I think I won't really have time to explain why this is the case. So you'll have to believe me a little bit. Is that for the integrable field theory that we will construct to be relativistic. So we, we will get a 2D field theory on sigma, and we would like this to be relativistic, to have Lorentz invariance along the, the direction PNX. Actually, this impose that this disordered effect is Ly, which are then forms uh, on sigma. So in general, they're forms on sigma, so they could be any uh, components along dt and any component on dx. They, that actually forces them to be along either dx plus or dx minus, where dx plus and x minus, they're the light co coordinates. And here, I think I use the same convention as, for instance, in, in Ben's lecture, which are the light cone coordinate, we define them as t plus minus x over 2, right? So, I mean, because we're talking about relativistic invariance, it's not so surprising to see light cone coordinates appearing, right? Because they, they define a light cone with respect to the, to, to the Minkowski metric. And here, the result is that for Ly, to, for, for really the theory to be relativistic, these disordered effects, we need to restrict them as being either along dx plus or along dx minus. And the effect of that is that it separates our defects into two parts. And in particular, because the defects are associated with the zeros, it separates the zeros zeta in two parts. Zeta plus and zeta minus such that, well, Ly is along dx plus if zeta belongs to, uh, sorry, if y belong to zeta plus, and of course, it's along dx minus if y belong to zeta minus. And just to say a few words about terminology again, so this we would then call this a Carroll disorder defect. Yes. Okay, a Carroll disorder defect, and this then we would call it an anti Carroll disorder defect. And in the end, what we get then combining all this together is that if I now reintroduce this, uh, what we got from, from, from relativistic invariance in this expression of LZ, I see that I have then L of Z, which is, I can decompose it apart along dx plus and apart along dx minus. And then along the dx plus part, I would have only contribution coming from the zeta plus terms. And then I would get some fields, which now we'll call u plus y, z minus y plus. And then I have the constant term, which here we'll call v plus. And so this is the part along the x plus. And then I have the part along the x minus, which is of the same form. But now we have some fields u minus y 
plus b minus dx minus, where so the u plus minus y and the v plus minus now they're just gc valued fields on sigma. So the difference with the decomposition I had before is before I had one form, so they could in principle have two components of, along T and X. And now, well, because we specify the directions of these one forms on either DX plus or DX minus, now I really see them as just their fields. They're not one forms. They have only one component. Okay, and this will actually be quite useful for us later so that we once again can box it. All right, so this would be then the end about the uh, disorder defects story and about the chirality and anti-chirality. So then let me ask at these points, are there any questions? Okay, then let me go on and well, now let me actually go on, on discussing a bit more about this field J hat, and in particular discuss the sorry, we have five section five point three. Let us discuss the freedom in J hat. So remember that. Well, when we introduced the Lux connection, the way we did it is we said that we do a gauge transformation by J hat. So we parametrize the, the gauge field in the Z bar component by this, so that this eliminates the Z bar component in the gauge of L. And then in the T and X direction, we had J hat LTX, J hat inverse minus dtx j hat j hat inverse. Okay. And well, now we focused on LTX before and we in particular showed that this was naturally the lax connection of the, of the integrable field theory that we'll get. And I would like to explain a bit more so some of the properties of this g hat. In particular, I would like to explain how unique it is and actually how non-unique this is and this will be useful for us later but in particular what we see is that a z bar is not changed by the transformation j hat goes to j hat v with V, which is a function from sigma to GC. And in particular, because I just say sigma and not the full M, it means it's independent of Z. And that well is just easy to see, right? So if, if V does not depend on Z, then the DZ bar kills it, right? Uh, and then I don't, it doesn't act on it. And then I just get a V and a V inverse coming from there. That's simply fine. So that actually doesn't change a Z bar. So in some sense, it seems that there is a freedom in, in, uh, in describing my, um, in, in defining this G hat, right? And one can also wonder what happens now on, the, uh, on this side, uh, on the side ATX of the, of the model. And in this case, what, what you can check is that if, if we do the gauges, the transformation of G hat by as G hat V, what it means for ATX is that ATX also is not changed if we also change L accordingly, and if we change L as so L mu would now become the L mu the inverse minus D mu the inverse. 
And so there you recognize basically a gauge transformation. Ah, sorry, actually I got it in the wrong order. So the inverse is actually on the left in this case, I think. So you have a V inverse here. Yeah, this is just V and then you have plus V inverse D mu. Okay. And well, this year, what we recognize is the gauge transformation, the standard gauge transformation of the lax connection. So we always know that if we have a lax connection in, in a 2D integral field theory, we could do uh, a, a gauge transformation by any function v, and this will all give another choice of lax connection, right? Because particularly it will still satisfy the zero curvature equation. And actually, this freedom here, we see it in the Fordwich and Simons theory by just as the multiplication of j hat on the right by v. Okay. And so that is part of the freedom we had in defining these j hats. And let me stress that in this case, for this freedom, this does not change a, right? So it's just. It's just that in our parameterization of the gauge field as follow, we, we have some kind of freedom in there, which is by this function V. But actually there's another freedom, which is that in addition to not changing A, we also can change A by just a gauge transformation. And well, gauge transformation in the end gives equivalent uh, physical configuration. So these also should be some kind of freedom that we, we have in the theory. So now what can, I, wonder what happens when I do a gauge transformation. So A goes to AU with U, which now is a any function from M to GC. Okay, we're not, in particular, I can have dependence in Z now. And well, what one shows is that this corresponds simply, this is equivalent, if I rephrase it in terms of J hat and L, this corresponds to J hat, which is now multiplied on the left by U. And this actually does not change L at all. So that's, well, I leave it as an exercise actually to, to, to check this. But it's basically, you look at this, expression for A, you do a gauge transformation by U, and you see that you will have to readapt to change J hat, but actually you won't have to, to change L. And that then corresponds to another freedom that we have in defining J hat, which is that we can multiply it on the left by basically any functions U, which, uh, which come then, which correspond then to a gauge transformation. But let me just stress here, that U should be compatible with boundary condition. And that will actually be quite important for us later. So remember that we have boundary condition at the poles defects, right? At the, at the poles of omega, where in particular, so we need to put some condition on N there and that will, we'll come back to that later in the afternoon. And the real gauge transformation will actually be only the one which are compatible with this boundary condition, which preserve it. Meaning that actually U needs to satisfy a few condition, a few boundary condition. And then I have the freedom of doing this transformation, J hat goes to U G hat only for the U which satisfies this one. And that, that will come out important for us later. Okay, so that's then the discussion of the freedom that we have in defining J hat. And now we'll basically let me just end with a few comments. On, well, this, this part. So one comment is that if you remember in, in, four, in Friedrich and Simon's theory, the standard Friedrich and Simon's theory, we said that the, the, the the theory was topological on M, right? Because it has this deformorphism invariance 
but without having to introduce any, uh, any dynamical metric on the field. And well, here one can wonder, is this a topological field theory or not? And well, the idea is that by introducing in the, by introducing this omega in the theory, we kind of broke the diffeomorphism invariants, at least along the CP1 part, right? So actually we'll break the, it's not true that the theory is completely topological because we had this omega, which is along dz, but it's actually still true that this for each and Simon's theory is topological along the sigma part. And now along the CP, the CP1 part, well, it's not topological anymore, but actually what we see is that we always have this thing that the dz components always decouple. So we had only derivative respect to dz bar and in particular then by going to a specific gauge, which were the, the gauge where it emitted the z bar component, we got something which depended meromorphically on this, C power, on this CP1 part. And this is, well, in the end, what why people sometimes call it this to be holomorphic theory along CP1. So typically the, the, the solution of the, of the theory, they define up to gauge transformation, they define something which is holomorphic along CP1 or meromorphic morphism. And this is together why it's this Wodich and Simon's theory is sometimes called the semi-holomorphic for Ditch and Simon's theory. And it's semi-holomorphic because it's holomorphic along the CP1 part, but it's still topological along the sigma part. Okay, so that also too, because you, you would, might find a lot in the literature, the name semi-holomorphic. So that's one also to explain a bit where it comes from. Also as another thing about comparing to literature. So this field J hat that I introduced uh, before, let me just mention that it's called sigma inverse in the uh, initial paper of Costello and Yamazaki about, about the field theories from Ford, Each and Simon. So if you want to compare what I say in the lectures with, with what's in, the, in this paper to come back to this initial paper, you will find that it's, it's called sigma inverse. And then this convention with G hat, it comes from, from slightly older papers uh, on this. And now, let me also mention something about Hamiltonian aspects. So on, on these lectures so far, I've only focused on Lagrangian aspect. We had the action, we had the Lax connection, which satisfied the zero curvature equation. And particularly, we know that this gives us an infinite number of conserved charges. But what we've heard from Anna's lecture is that actually integrability is something a bit more than just an infinity of conserved quantities, we would even like them to be all in involution one way or another, right? We would like the Poisson bracket to be zero. And that is a more constraining thing, right? So for that, when we need to study the, um, the Poisson bracket of the, of the charges that come from this, lax, uh, from this lax connection that we just constructed, and for that, we need to go to the Hamiltonian level, we need to do the canonical analysis, compute Poisson brackets, and in the end, because everything, all conserved charges are constructed from the Lax matrix, so the LX part, we can look at, uh, in the end, the Poisson bracket is related to the bracket of these, the components of LX together. And actually what one can do is we can do the Hamilton analysis of this uh, for each and Simon's theory. And what one finds is that we find what is called the Maya bracket for the Lax matrix Alex. And well, this was done by, uh, by in a paper by Benoit Vicedo in 2019. If you want uh, more references, uh, there, is, there is the references in the, in, the, in the written notes. And the consequence of this Maya bracket is that the charges in the monodromy commute. Well, the they Poisson commute, right? So they, 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 they classically commute, the Poisson commute. And in particular, this gives us the, uh, the, the fact that the model is really integrable also in the Hamiltonian sense, 
that all our all, all, all of our integrable structure they 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 all pass on they all init volution. And let me just mention that this Hamiltonian aspect is exactly what makes the relation with what is what are called affine Goda models, which is a name I briefly mentioned in the in the introduction. And well, so these affine Goda models, there are another kind of systematic uh, approach that was proposed to study integrable field theories in two dimension, which is now based really on the Hamiltonian formalism and which is a slightly more algebraic construction is based on representation of what I called affine Kexmudi algebras. And in the end, they also give a way of systematically constructing integrable field theory with relaxed connection. And actually what was shown then in this paper by Benoit Vissido is that there is a very deep relation between this and Pauli Chen Simon's theory because by taking the uh, taking the Hamilton analysis of the four H and Simon's theory, we get this Maya bracket, which is actually exactly what uh, in the end allows to to reformulate things as affine Goda models. So in the end, these affine Goda models and four H and Simon's theory, they're just the two faces of the same approach: one in the Lagrangian formulation with actions, and one in the Hamiltonian formulation, which is slightly more algebraic. And just to mention here about terminology. When we write then omega, this neuromorphic one form that has been quite important for me in these lectures, omega equals phi z dz. Well, in the language of affine Goda models or all this Hamiltonian integrability, phi z is called the twist function. So when you see all the literatures about, in particular, integrable sigma models like principal car models, the deformations, and so on. You might encounter this name sometimes, which is called the twist function. And well, if you see it, you can remember that in the Polish and Simon's case, the Polish and Simon approach, it just correspond to this omega. Okay. And well, the last comment I want to say, which will be maybe slightly longer, is something that I said I postponed a bit before, which is talking about reality conditions. So, so far we considered everything to be complex. Our gauge field was complexified, phi z it can have complex uh, poles and so on. But in the end, that tells us that then the action would be a complex number, which in the end give, would give a slightly non-physical theory. So to really get a physical theory, you would like to put some reality conditions. And well, that, that can be done. So for instance, on the on this omega or on this twist function, what we ask is that it satisfies the following condition, that if I take phi z and I conjugate the whole thing, this is the same as phi of z bar. And so that conjugating the whole thing is conjugating just the, the spectral parameter. And well, that has some consequences, which are in particular that, for instance, the poles and the zeros of, of omega, which are important for us, there are either real or in pairs of complex conjugates. Okay. And well, here for simplicity, I will actually always suppose that the zeros zeta are real. Yeah, okay, this is, let me say this is a supposition. And this is just to, to simplify uh, our life, we'll suppose that the zeros zeta, they're always real. So that's the reality condition for, for phi z, so for omega. We also want a reality condition on the gauge field itself. And so for that, we first need to choose inside of the Lie algebra, the complexified Lie algebra GC, we want to choose a real form, G in GC. So for instance, uh, if, if GC is, uh, is SLN, C, so if the complexify algebra is SNNC, then the we have possible real forms. We can take, for instance, 
SUN, it's a real form of SLNC, or also SLNR is another real form, which is this one is the compact real form, this one the split real form, and there are other possibilities like the SUPQ or, or others. And in particular, every choice of real form is characterized by an anti-linear my handwriting is getting worse and worse as we advance in the, in the lecture. Anti-linear uh, involutive automorphism tau of the complexified algebra such that the uh, real form is just a set of fixed points in GC. Tau is just the way we define complex conjugation on our complexified algebra. And then the, the points which are fixed under the, the, compl the, the complex conjugation, we, these are the points, the, the elements we call the real one. And in terms of this tau, we then uh, put some reality conditions on, on the gauge field, which is that if I take my gauge field, component of my gauge field A mu, which depends then on T, X, and Z, and I conjugate it, then I want to find my gauge field T, X, but now evaluated at Z bar. And that is the equivalent of what I had here for the, the, the omega. So if I take the conjugation of phi Z against phi of Z bar, well, now I have the equivalent, which is that if I act by conjugation on the complexified Lie algebra GC, so this tau, I get now the gauge field evaluated at the complex conjugate set. And these in particular have some consequences. So we know that we parameterize the A in terms of L and G hat, the lax connection and G hat. So in particular, for instance, okay, let me say first one thing is that with these two reality conditions on tau, on A and on phi, we actually can show that SA, the action is, is real, which is in the end what we, we wanted. And then also let me say that in terms of the parameterization in terms of G hat, G hat and L, this in, uh, also tells us that L mu satisfy the same thing here. So acting by tau simply send z to z bar and the same thing for j hat where now for j hat i actually considered tau so tau before was defined on the lie algebra but we can always lift it to the group and then in this case because g hat is valued in the group we hacked in this one uh, sorry, actually, I was there's way too many z bar here. On this side, there should be no z bar. Okay. And well, the last thing I, I'd like to say about reality condition is that because we have this condition that tau should send z to z bar in the lax connection, if we go back to the expression of our lax connection here in terms of the zeros of the twist function y, uh, y right? So it is these poles that we had, these disordered effects. Well, in general, if we, if we act by then tau, what it will do is it will send z to z bar, and then it will typically exchange a zero with its complex conjugate. And remember here that for simplicity, I make the assumption that um, my zeros were actually all real. And this then tells us that because the y in zetas are real, then the corresponding fields, u plus minus y, and also, well, the constant field, then they actually are fixed by tau, meaning they belong to the real form. 
So for instance, they, they instead of being just in any SLNC, they actually are restricted to being an SUN or an SLNR and so on, depending on our choice of real form. And that also ensures that in the end, the lack connection, we, although it's complexified because there's a spectral parameter, in the end, it's still expressed in terms of real fields. OK, so I think that was all I wanted to say for this second lecture this morning. I will actually finish even slightly earlier than what I could have. But then I guess I, that leaves a bit of time for questions, if there are any. Hi. Ah, oh, great. Oh. Um, I just want to ask about this um, this parameterization of a z bar in terms of uh, g hat. I yeah. think when you first introduced it, you said it was, or you said it was an assumption that you could reach the gauge a z bar equals zero, and I guess that also means it's an assumption that you can parameterize it in this way. Can you just comment on that assumption and say? When yes, so you ask you ask the tough questions. <laughs> so I think this is actually a bit subtle. So this is the equivalent. This a z bar is zero. This gauge is would be the equivalent of some kind of actual gauge, typically. And I think in general, in the actual gauge, like we would have in three D, this x i was zero. I think this you should always be able to reach it. I think here yeah, the subtlety comes from the fact that we are in a complex. We are in the CP1, and we're actually reaching something only in the, DZ, in the DZ bar component, but not in DZ. And it's actually a subtle, it, it, I think it's subtle. Even, even, in the, even if I don't uh, take this thing with, uh, with like elements in the group, even if I think it as a, as a abelian group, if I want to solve the equation, like I have a function of both Z and Z bar, and I want to write it as just a, a derivative respect to Z bar only, this, I think, already, I think it's true, but it's already quite subtle that it's, it's true. And it, it's because we, we went from just one coordinate to, to really two complex coordinate, and I'm working only with Z bar. And now the non abelian version, from what I understood, I'm really no expert on that, but that's why I kind of took a, a bit, uh, I was careful, and I just say assumption here. From what I understood, it might, there might be some cases a bit exotic where it would not be true, actually, that you can write it as a derivative respect to Z bar, because there's still a dependence in there. So Sylvan, uh, related to this, is it correct to say that uh, you are restricting yourself to a subspace of the possible field configurations? If indeed this, yeah, if there are indeed problems with this, in, in the end, we restrict to certain configuration of fields, which are the one which in the end will be, I mean, of course, for us, it's a very important assumption because this is what will give us the lax connection. So uh, indeed, we in this case, we would restrict to only the, this type of configuration. Although I might say that I think most of, although there, there might be some problem, I think they're kind of a little bit exotic, right? Most and configurations. I guess that for, you it's enough, for you, it's enough to show that uh, you have some examples and from those you can construct uh, the integrable model. Exactly, yeah. I mean. Here, we don't really want to claim that every solution of 40 and Simons correspond to an integrable field theory. We just say, okay, if I have this type of solution, they give me an integrable field theory. And actually for me, that, that's what I want. I just want to generate a lot of integrable field theory from there. But if there are some exotic solution of 40 and Simon that correspond to something else, maybe that's not so much a problem for us. Hi. So in the comment, you talked about the Hamiltonian aspect, and uh, you say that uh, we can compute the Maillet bracket for LX, and so uh, the charges of the monodromy. I was wondering, are those charges uh, local? So in general, they're non-local. Um, so because really, these are really the charges in the, in the monodromy. So in general, these are, these are non-local uh, charges, although when you when you uh, when you extract things around the pole of the lux connection, then you will find the tower and some tower of local ones. But in general, even the non-local one, they all commute together. Uh, but let me also mention that in addition to these non-local charges, there are also local charges, which are exactly the one that were discussed in Ben's uh, in Ben's to, uh, lectures for the the PCM, which are then of higher, higher degree. They start at the quadratic one, and then they they start being higher and higher degree. 
And these also exist in general for all these body and Simon theory, all these affine Venn models. And they can be constructed and also all in involution and they also commute with the model of Yes, because um, I was wondering if the locality of the charges depend on the fact that we were working with simple pole of omega or uh, the two things are not related at all. Okay, so for the the poles of omega, actually, they can be even higher the poles, and that would they would still be a monodromic charges. We would we would have either non-local, I mean, both non-local and local charges there. For okay. for all type of and actually even very simple example. So the the next lecture we'll do the PCM example, and this would actually be be coming from a second order pole. So that's what we'll see. So okay. even very okay. simple example like the PCM come already from higher order pools. Thank you. Maybe another quick question. Uh, I don't remember if you uh, said it already. Uh, can you replace CP1 by something else? And yes. Indeed. What are the qualitative changes in the construction? So uh, indeed here in CP, in, when I use CP1, everywhere I had CP1, I could put something which uh, would be any Riemann, uh, so any compact Riemann surface. And then I would also have on it some omega, which, uh, which would be a meromorphic one form. And then I can, for all these things, I can construct, uh, I can construct new uh, integrable field theories. And this actually, I think, is something which is quite new because before we mostly knew example which were based, uh, except for very few cases, we mostly knew example based on rational connections which were then on cp1 but here this opens the the, the, the possibility of doing higher genus construction so based on for instance elliptic uh, things or even higher genus thing the main proper the main difficulty is then extracting the the 2d field theory so as i will try to show then in the next lecture in the case of cp1 we kind of now understand how to do it with some example but i think even now quite in generality but when we start to do higher things higher genus thing i for the moment, I don't think we have a very, very concrete expression, for instance, of the, the models we get. So we would get still integrable sigma models typically, but we, I don't think we have like a complete closed expression of the, um, of the metric and the B field that it defines. Although there have been some progress recently, for instance, in a paper by Derry Berry, that was, I think maybe one, I mean, a few months ago, where he did, he writes it in terms of some bundles. Uh, the, the target space is a, is a moduli space of bundles and there are some expressions of the metric and so on in terms of some, some nice uh, objects, geometrical object in these bundles. But in terms of really writing things extremely explicitly in coordinates and saying I have this action, well, this uh, geometry and it's integrable, I think we're not there yet. Okay, thanks. Thank you.